Jacksonville Historical Society. This is the show where we analyze and discuss Jacksonville history. And on today's show, we'll be taking a look at the city's history through books on the city's heritage. And there is none better, be, no one better to do that than Dr. Wayne Wood, well-known local historian, uh, optometrist, and recognized as the godfather of Jacksonville history. Wayne, welcome to the show. Thank you, Emily. It's a pleasure to be here again. Well, it, it's always a pleasure to have you. You're the author of seven books on Jacksonville's history. And what I hope you'll do for us today is just give us a spin through Jacksonville's history using your books, uh, your wonderful publications as a basis for doing that. Well, thank you. Let, let's start by looking at a photo. What do you say? I'd love to. Love to. Okay, if you go back in the mirror of time and look at this old photo coming up on the screen now, this is 1874 downtown Jacksonville on Bay Street. And this was a major tourist era for Jacksonville and northern tourists lined the streets. And among them were photographers who captured the pictures of northerners coming to visit Jacksonville. On this day, uh, around the noon hour, a young Afro-American youth was walking down the street with a box under one arm, one pant leg rolled up, and a wonderful hat pushed down over his ears when a tourist photographer named Chandler Seaver saw him walking along and asked him to pose for a moment while he took a picture. And it took about 30 seconds to make the exposure. And just in that fraction of a second, he captured that moment on the glass plate inside his camera and saved a moment from 1874 that we can enjoy today. This was one of Seaver's most popular photographs of this little boy standing there on Bay Street. And a woman from New Jersey was one of the ones who bought this picture and took it home with her as a commemorative of her trip to Jacksonville. Later, the woman died. And even later still, her great-grandson found this picture in a box in that attic in New Jersey. And he didn't know what it was, so he put it up on eBay, and I bought it almost 130 years later uh, for $34.50. And now we have, through the magic of digitalization, the picture of that moment of time, a moment of light in Jacksonville in the 1870s. And what a wonderful thing the camera is. Photography was really invented about 15 years before, about 20 years before that picture was taken. A couple of Frenchmen developed the process, and photography came to the United States. Oliver Wendell Holmes was so taken by this new phenomenon that he called it the mirror with a memory. Photography certainly won the hearts and minds of Americans. And so a few years ago, the Jacksonville Historical Society set out to write a book about Jacksonville's photographic heritage. And we came up with a book called The Jacksonville Family Album, which is chock full of hundreds and hundreds of never before published photographs of early Jacksonville right up into the present time. Most of these pictures are museum quality. They're stunning in their beauty. And it was a pleasure for me to work with you and others to produce this book, Emily, as a book that the Jacksonville Historical Society has published and has for sale. Now, one of the earliest photos in this book is of Mayor John Mills. This was taken around 1854, 1855, and is one of the early pictures in the Jacksonville Historical Society's vast archives, and also the very first major picture in this book I just described. I'd like to go through some of the photos in this book to give your viewers uh, an idea of what this book is about, because photographs, history, pretty much parallels Jacksonville's history. Jacksonville was founded in 1821. Photography was invented in 1839. And as we see the development of photography, we also see Jacksonville's growth. And here you see a neat photo taken also on Bay Street about 1864 of northern troops uh, who were occupying Jacksonville. Here you see some of the, the northern troops during the Civil War at the uh, wharf at the end of Laura Street. Photos capture memories and time the way that no verbal description can do. And so I love to celebrate these photographs and share them with our readers who can read comments on the picture, such as the many stern wheelers and paddle wheelers and schooners that brought tourists to Jacksonville and brought them to these wonderful hotels in the 1870s and 80s. Jacksonville was the tourist destination for the eastern United States. With those tourists came curios. At the curio shops along Bay Street, you could buy a stuffed alligator or a stuffed sunfish, or who knows what else. And portraits were also made by photographers. Here you see a very stunning portrait. That's one of my favorite ones in the book. This man with the beady eyes and the scruffy beard was none other than Lim Turner, who the street in North Jacksonville is named after. We have dozens and dozens of portraits uh, of 
uh, Jacksonville's memorable characters, as well as Jacksonville's memorable historical events and buildings, such as the Subtropical Exposition, built in the late 1880s as a tourist uh, attraction for Jacksonville, now torn down, or to commemorate the Spanish-American War when thousands of troops descended on Jacksonville. And the Spanish-American War wasn't much of a war, but it did bring uh, thousands of soldiers to Jacksonville who uh, met and married many of Jacksonville's young ladies. And the war was celebrated uh, in 1899 with a jubilee for peace. Here you see a picture in, Memor in Riverside Park where thousands of people gathered to celebrate the close of the Spanish-American War in 1899. Such beautiful pictures like this not only tell about our city, but they are works of art unto themselves with the countenance of those lovely ladies with Uncle Sam in the middle uh, being a wonderful picture that could hang on the wall of any museum in the country. They are truly our uh, local treasures and our heritage. You may see some of the early cars that use the uh, beaches as hard-packed sand for their raceway to set world speed records. Or you may see amusement parks such as the Dixieland Park on the south side. Other ways that Jacksonville amused itself uh, heralded in these photographs include the ostrich farm and the great roller coaster and amusement park at uh, Jacksonville Beach. Or the airplanes that landed on the beach as the only runway in town or even the silent movie era where you here see Laurel, where you see Oliver Hardy who became the duo of Laurel and Hardy in later movies making one of his early movies on Riverside Avenue. Or you might see fishermen catching big fish. Jacksonville has so many ways to amuse us today and throughout history. We've found these wonderful diversions using our subtropical climate, our beaches, our beautiful river as a place where people were attracted and certainly a wonderful uh, destination for photographers who captured these images. Other photographers concentrated on portraits and up through the years we see the changing clothing styles. Uh, here you see the egret feather hat of a famous movie star pictured here in Jacksonville. Or you just see children going about the things that children do well, playing. Or you see teenagers, in this case Elvis Presley in his first gig here in Jacksonville, the first time he played at the Coliseum he was billed third behind three other acts. <laughs> or you see wonderful humanitarian citizens like Eartha White and even the famous ph photograph, probably Jacksonville's most world famous photograph taken by Rocco Morabito called The Kiss of Life that won a Pulitzer Prize. So these are some of the photographs that make up Jacksonville's photographic heritage and that are captured in this over 400 page book that we did. And of course, that book is called The Jacksonville Family Album, The Art of Photography, over 150 years. And it's, uh, Wayne, it's an extraordinary book that you authored. And uh, I really want the viewing public to know this book has gone into a second printing. And I fear when they're gone, they're gone because uh, it's, it's a mammoth undertaking to pr print this. And I will say that... Uh, it has been stated by many, this is the most beautiful book ever printed on our city's history. Well, thank you, Emily. It's been very gratifying, and I was lucky to be the one who got to go through all these 40,000 photographs oh. that we reviewed to put this book together. But there are other photos in time and other books, and I'd like to talk about some other books we've done. Uh, one is um, talking about the Great Fire of Jacksonville. 1901, Jacksonville had its day in infamy, and it occurred to us in the Historical Society that on the centennial, of the 1901 fire, we should do a book. And so with the late Bill Foley, I put together this book on the Great Fire of Jacksonville uh, when Jacksonville burned down in 1901. Now, a little background on this was Jacksonville, as I mentioned earlier, was a city of great hotels. Many of these hotels were made of wood. It was natural that a building with all, a, a city with all these major wooden buildings could catch on fire. And on this day, it caught on fire to beat the ban. This was the third largest fire in the history of the United States, a city fire, and those big wooden hotels uh, caught on fire as a mattress factory over in La Villa, the uh, western part of the city, sprang into flames and the cinders from that fire spread across Jacksonville on the little wooden roofs of houses jumping block to block and before the afternoon was over thousands of buildings burned, almost 10,000 people were left homeless and the smoke could be seen in the sky all the way to North Carolina. And the glowing sky could be seen in Savannah, Georgia, and Miami as Jacksonville uh, great catastrophe happened. Now, this fire 
and this photograph actually is just one of the most startling images to come out of this era because it captures the horror and the mayhem that ensues when a major city is being destroyed. Uh, probably 90% of downtown Jacksonville was engulfed in flames and destroyed in one day. The day after the fire, what formerly was a thriving southern city was a wasteland, looking like the Hiroshima after the bomb had been dropped. And as the city leaders looked over the damage, you must have just imagined what could have gone through their minds as the enormity of the task of rebuilding a city. But rebuild it they did, uh, with searing images like this of burned out churches looking much like uh, World War I and II's desolation of some of the European cities, and nightmare images of people wandering through the wasteland. It's hard to imagine how they rallied people to build, but rebuild they did. So many people were homeless that the building industry just blossomed overnight in rebuilding all these destroyed buildings. So within a year or two after the Great Fire, there were almost as many buildings had been built in Jacksonville as had existed before the fire. And so it, it was a, a, an amazing event that put Jacksonville on the world stage. And the book we wrote about the fire is filled with stories of people who endured this day and tells how the fire started, how it spread, and I think is a wonderful narrative. Uh, you know, many writers of fiction would love to have a book like this with such colorful characters and such a dramatic plot. And we got to write history that has the feel of a novel because it, it is such a dramatic story. It is, and the Jacksonville Historical Society was really proud to publish your work on that. And um, a lot of people uh, are just stunned to realize uh, this was the third. This is the third largest fire in metropolitan uh, U.S. history. I mean, this is just amazing. Second behind San Francisco and Chicago. That's right. And, and uh, on May third, two thousand six, which that's right here. This show will typically air before that time. A few events air right after that time. That will be the one hundred and fifth anniversary of the Great Fire. And uh, we keep those books at our office. What's left of them? It's it's just a wonderful document of of a time that uh, all time in Jacksonville his history is typically measured before the fire or after the fire. A momentous event, and that leads us into the discussion of the next book I'd like to show you. This book was written about Henry John Clutho, uh, who was an architect who came to Jacksonville after the fire to help with the city's rebuilding. This fire made headlines all over the world, and Clutho was a young architect in New York, and he read in the New York Times about Jacksonville's burning, and was, within two months was here in the city trying to be the one to design the major part of the skyline, and by gosh, he was enormously successful. The book, The Architecture of Henry John Clutho, was written by noted architect Bob Broward, and this book came out in 1989. It was a book that was small in format and was only had a few uh, copies printed. It was out of print almost immediately, and so the Jacksonville Historical Society uh, decided this book deserved to be reprinted, to be reprinted in a larger beautiful format, and so we've made a lovely coffee table book and included a lot of new information, over a hundred new photographs in th this book on Jacksonville's most important artist and architect. Clutho was a genius, and not just at designing buildings, but also as an entrepreneur. He came here and convinced the city fathers that he was the best thing since sliced bread, and that he would lead them from this uh, decimated city to a modern city, and by gosh, he was just an uh, incredible leader. His first buildings, such as the, library, such as the uh, city library and the city hall, were very classical and traditional buildings in the European mode, which was popular at the time. About 1905, Clutho met Frank Lloyd Wright uh, in New York, and his ideas on architecture changed radically. And he came back to Jacksonville building buildings that were very modern in style and ambitious in their engineering. Here on the right, you see Florida's first skyscraper designed by Clutho, the Bisbee Building, next to the Marble Bank. Both of these two buildings, by the way, are still there. And you see its radical construction form using reinforced concrete, which was a brand new material uh, untested in the South before Clutho took up the championship of this new construction technique, which allowed buildings to be built with huge windows, since the brick walls did not need to support the building itself, and allowing buildings to soar not just five or six stories, but seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven stories into the sky, they truly were skyscrapers. Here you see the building after it had been completed, that is the left part of your screen here, you see the completed, thin, soaring skyscraper, and Mr. Bisbee was so thrilled that he had the building rented before it was even completed, he asked Clutho to double it. 
So now the building stands twice its original width on Forsyth Street. One of Florida's remarkable buildings because of being the first skyscraper, but also part of our downtown's historic landscape. Clutho designed other worthy and wonderful skyscrapers such as the Florida Life Building, another tall, thin, soaring skyscraper that uh, at the top of it, your eyes led up to these wonderful scroll uh, designs made of a material called terracotta, which allowed the artist to make flourishes in design that adorn buildings as things of beauty and works of art. Clutho's own house was also very radical, sitting on Main Street in the Springfield neighborhood. This building is very similar to many of those now called the prairie style that populate the Midwest and were uh, uh, often influenced by Frank Lloyd Wright and other architects who had large bands of windows and strong horizontal houses that uh, hugged the land, giving them the name the prairie style. Clutho's home here was the first prairie style house in Florida. But his magnum opus, his greatest tour de force work of architecture was the St. James Building, one of the largest department stores in the South at the time, and now uh, one of our city's treasures that still exists facing uh, Hemming Park. The wonderful design of the facade of this building is heralded by these large seashell-like scrolls that are part of the um, design, but the interior was also spectacular with an 80-foot octagonal skylight uh, that cast uh, a wonderful daylight glow onto the Cohen Brothers merchandise in the department store below. These, this skylight was held up by these uh, intriguing uh, heroic sculptures, atlas-like figures that supported the roof. And incredibly, that building has survived all this time and is now our city hall. Clutho did many other radical designs embodying this uh, architecture of the Midwest loosely known as a prairie style. Many of these buildings have now been destroyed, but those that we have left uh, have this wonderful sense of design that Clutho brought to Jacksonville and made his architecture stand out on the world stage. Uh, here you see uh, eagles adorning one of the schools in North Jacksonville. Clutho died uh, in 1964, an old man. He was penniless. He lost his money in the film industry as one of Jacksonville's greatest architects of all times, only six people came to his funeral, one of whom was Bob Broward, who wrote the book that we collaborated with in making this book on Clutha. We were so fortunate that Bob was able to gather the things that remained of, of Henry Clutho and, and document this as a real scholarly plus highly entertaining work in this book, uh, The Architecture of Henry John Clutho. And speaking of that, I believe Bob Broward, now just a dean of Jacksonville architecture, as Clutho was in his day, uh, he's getting ready to celebrate a birthday. Do you, we, he is about to celebrate his 80th birthday, and uh, we're going to celebrate that soon. And uh, Bob's had a remarkable career. Oh, he, yeah. he spent many years with Frank Lloyd Wright and uh, studied at his uh, feet and became one of Florida and America's great architects of the day. And he's truly one of Jacksonville's treasures as well. As well, two great uh, personalities in Jacksonville's history, Henry Clutho and the author of that book, Bob Broward.